Well, thank you very much for the lovely welcome. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here to present to such an important audience. Of course, um, I strongly believe that we need to have a much better and more open conversation with those engaging with the conflict directly. Um, I'm going to, as mentioned before, answer three questions. There we go. What is the current state of violent conflict across Africa? What are the key challenges? What are the drivers and causes? And what are the key strategic security implications? And I'm going to start by saying something that um, maybe most people don't often uh, don't often think about, which is the continent itself is actually not the most violent conf uh, continent by by a long way. Um, in fact, and the most violent places are certainly not in Africa. There is a, a tendency to um, to focus quite a bit on the enduring conflicts within the African state for, for good reason. But I think that we should take a, a small step back and recognize that the problems of violence and conflict, when we look at them from a, a spectrum of political violence, are certainly not uniquely found on the continent, nor are they mostly found on the continent. In fact, in a recent analysis that we did, we found that, of course, the most severely affected countries um, have one African country, in fact, in it, which is Mali. Um, and we based this severe severity index on danger, which is violence targeting civilians, deadliness, which is the fatality rate of that conflict, the diffusion rate, so how many subnational areas, subnational administrations within a country tend to be affected with conflict, and fragmentation, the number of actors. And there's 46 countries and territories represented here. They account for 95% of all the political violence events recorded by ACLED in 2002. The remaining 5% were distributed across 119 other countries and territories. So approximately 30% of all violent conflict took place in those countries that have extreme severity, four out of four, and 53% in the areas of high conflict severity levels, three out of four, of course, which Burkina Faso, Congo, Nigeria, and Somalia, South Sudan are included there. So I really do want to, to emphasize that while the while the issues with political violence across African states are prolific, it's not uniquely so. Um, and in fact, I think that there there needs to be a bit of reflection. I think about how I would I would be more worried in the future that some some conflict trends are in fact exported to Africa rather than intensifying within Africa, which I'll get to in a little bit. So many countries in the highest severity category share a number of, of characteristics. As mentioned before, they're home to multiple conflicts, often with limited areas of overlap. Um, and that, of course, can be said. They're conflict with many active groups. And as I will discuss in a second, whereas Africa may not be the most violent continent by any stretch, it is the continent that is producing the most violent groups. Um, and that in and of itself indicates an issue with fragmentation, or as I would put it, the violence market, that is um, is something to, to really be concerned about. Um, so these groups, of course, are fighting each other as frequently as they clash with state security forces. Militias are playing a leading role in this violence. And so the, the kind of previous interpretation we had about civil wars and their, uh, their likelihood to happen in, for example, poor places or in areas of marginalization. Whereas that may continue, the actual start of civil wars or new civil wars has, has decreased precipitously. And in fact, civil wars do not make up the most, um, let's say, active category of conflict by any means. It's really militia en engagements. So peace agreements, which I'm sure Paul will speak to, and post-conflict arrangements have changed the nature of violence, but they have failed to fully resolve or reduce it. And of course, um, often it is because, and again, I'm, I'm not an expert in peace agreements, but rather what comes before them. Um, but I will say that the peace agreements tend to not address the politics that gave rise to the conflict in the first place. I will also say that one of the characteristics that we're seeing more globally, but also within African states, is that violent countries are now often middle income with relatively high rates of development, and they have adopted some democratic features. So the largest growth in conflict is occurring in middle income democratizing countries. And I'm happy to note here something new that we have started at ACLED is looking at 
population exposure rates to armed organized political violence within five kilometers of events. So ACLED collects events information. And what we're able to do is then look at the, the exposure of the population around that event, whether it's one kilometer or five kilometers. And as you can see here, the exposure rate, which is very low in blue, and very high in red, um, indicates that African states have a very mixed rate of exposure. So, for example, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, you have about a 26% exposure rate. This is indicating that about 26% of the population of the Congo is exposed to at least one event um, every every year. In fact, this was 2022. Um, that actually is, is not um, telling the full story. About half of that, or about 13% of the population of Congo, is likely to experience two to nine events over the course of a year. So you have some very, very highly exposed areas and you have some very, very lightly exposed areas. But as conflict becomes more urbanized, as we can see within the Sudan example in the last few weeks, we can expect that far more people will become exposed to at least one event of uh, armed organized violence. And that is a problem. Um, and in fact, as you can see here, some of the highest rates are actually recorded in Palestine, Syria, Mexico, and Brazil, and Colombia. And those places, with the exception of, of Palestine, share some characteristics that gives me some concern about African states more broadly. And that is because those places have a number of active militia actors rather than one, one concerted actor pursuing let's say, a political agenda against the government, they have multiple actors that are pursuing often violence at the very local or regional level, often within themselves and at the behest of elites. So Africa leads in a particular way, and that is the number of unique groups that we find across the continent. So here in orange, we have militia groups, below that state forces, which is a pretty steady line, um, and external forces and insurgent forces. So we have very few insurgent forces, that um, across Africa, they are very active. I, I want to make it clear that the graph below shows the proportion of violence that they're responsible for. And you can see that the, the limited number of insurgent forces are actually responsible for quite a significant amount of violence. And that of course is related to Al-Shabaab, JNM, um, the ISIS affiliates, et cetera, across the continent. But but much more so, this is a story of fragmented militias and their ability to proliferate and diffuse across the continent. Um, and it's, a, it's quite a serious issue. Here, of course, we have the unique group numbers in just the very, very, very recent past. And as you can see, a very steady rate of, of insurgents, um, typically about 25 groups claim to have a national agenda against the government, whereas literally hundreds of militias can be active at any one time. They peak around the period of elections and any sort of area or place of political competition. And this will speak to the causes that I mentioned before. So whereas these groups don't necessarily commit a huge number of violent events, the issue is that they are both active and latent. So they can be recalled at any moment to produce um, episodes of political violence. I would say security services have been particularly, um, are finding these groups particularly difficult to deal with, uh, in part because of their almost amorphous nature. And as I mentioned before, they're, they're transactional violence, if you will. But they also differ quite significantly. So here's an example of looking at the difference between on six different metrics, how militias, rebels, gangs, cartels, and local community um, identity militias and mobs differentiate themselves. And you can see here, I used the scale of the motive, whether or not it's local or national. So the scale of the political motive, the capacity for violence, again, high to low, their coordination and hierarchy, again, higher or lower, the number that we see active. So how proliferate are they? Whether or not they target civilians more or less. And then of course, their economic motives. And as I mentioned before, my worry in certain very, very high violence areas across African states, in particular Nigeria and some areas of Western Africa, is that they will adopt a model of conflict that 
is closer to the Mexican or Brazilian model than it is to a, a more typical, as I mentioned, insurgent type of conflict. And this is a worry because these groups are incredibly difficult to get rid of. They're incredibly violent, and that violence tends to be against civilians. They have an economic motive more so than a political one. And so their, um, their engagement with any sort of peace or negotiation process is going to be uh, very limited. And they have very high rates of coordination and violence capacity. So it comes back to what I'll say at the end about why we think such groups are um, proliferating, not just, of course, within African states, but more broadly, and what can be done about it now. And the the first point is that the security services need to be involved as quickly as possible and in the most um in in an, in an attempt to get rid of the corruption that gives rise to this type of groups so where is this violence coming from where is the conflict coming from i do want to emphasize that uh some about three key points here which is that unlike how we typically talk about violence which again is Harking back to some research on civil wars, conflict appears to be adapting to institutional change rather than dissipating. There has been, I think, a very, let's say, um, hard to get rid of theory that uh, marginalization and poverty and identity are at the key or at the at the source of many of these conflicts. And I really want to emphasize that that is not in fact the case. There's There are three problems with commonly theorized relationships between governance and conflict. One is the presumption that national political institution and practices can shape or mitigate violence. In fact, Countries with outwardly similar institutional forms and capacities can exhibit significant differences in their political violence. In African countries characterized by regime longevity or single party dominance or extensive patronage systems and recurrent elections, such as those in Zimbabwe, Uganda, and Sudan, there's vastly different levels and forms of political violence. The likelihood of experiencing a civil war, a long running militia conflict or violent unrest is far more closely linked to the domestic political fault lines of these countries. And that's a really important point that I think people often miss, which is that domestic politics causes conflict. That's it. Domestic politics. So if you are aware of the domestic politics within your state and you are aware of who might benefit from using violence to forward their own aims, that's where you should be looking. Second, a, a multiplicity of violence occurs within individual countries, and this includes those countries where typical governance and political exclusion explanations suggest a civil war should emerge, but because of the changes that have happened within institutions, we often find that militias come about, right? So what we have effectively is several types of co-occurring conflict across states, making discussions about power distributions and conflict very difficult to fit to the current situation. Again, Sudan is a really good example. You have effectively two armies fighting against each other. These people had significant power. This was not an issue about marginalization or exclusion, but rather it's a competition for power. And once we start thinking of things as a competition for power, many of these conflicts make a lot more sense. So as I mentioned before, domestic politics matter because Countries have a geography of power and a hierarchy of power, many elites and many appointments. Regimes are highly inclusive of many different ethno-political groups and regions. So the issue is not over access to power from the outside, but it's about competition for power on the inside, right? Conflict is a competition for power amongst the powerful. It is rarely, if ever, due to any shifts in ideology. So it's about interests. And we think of them about interests. Again, many of these decisions to use conflict or who benefits from conflict becomes a lot clearer. And we can understand why, for example, an elite would hire a militia to hold or contest an appointment, uh, much more so than an ethnic group or an ethno-regional group seeking to have better representation. So this is part of an ongoing issue where I think subnational elites and subnational politics have not received enough attention. But these relationships and their character underlie the frequent variations in power conflict and development we see across African states. So I do want to mention some things about power that I think have recently come into 
into into clear view for us on the research side, which is power is far more likely to be formally assigned than informally manufactured. So we need to think of power as appointments. And with that comes the other powers to appoint, patronage, state rents, et cetera. So authority at the senior formal level, like the cabinet, is inclusive. It can be unbalanced, but it is generally inclusive. So why is it unbalanced? It's because elite influence on the executive is demonstrated through this imbalance. However, large groups, powerful agendas, and agents are not necessarily more represented. In fact, smaller groups, those that are easier to manipulate, are typically more overrepresented in cabinets. And this type of appointment is proliferated at all scales of many African states. So as I mentioned before, rather than think about conflict as a, as a response to misrepresentation or exclusion, what we find in our research on African cabinets and African appointments is that most governments are highly inclusive. They may, as I mentioned, have a malapportioned cabinet, which means maybe some groups have more power than they normally would based on demographic patterns, but across African states, and in fact, here's the examples Here's the first uh, cut. Across the representation measures for 37 African states, we find very high rates of inclusion. About 75% of all ethno-regional groups are included, both ethnic, political, and, uh, and regional groups. Um, malapportionment is about 20%, which means that about 20% of the number of seat positions tends to be skewed. But what we have effectively is an inclusive political system. So it's not inclusion that, that is at the heart of some of these matters, but I will say that militias have entirely proliferated since we start, started to see a highly inclusive system. And the reason is, is that if you expand the government and you expand the number of positions available, what you get is competition for those positions. And that's an important and, and significant outcome here. So what we have, what I think we have here is that we have certain political environments that give rise to either high rates of or low rates of political violence, high rates or low rates of state violence. And, and let's just say that the market for non-state armed groups tends to be either very active or less active. So we have monopolies, whereas repressive violence with high late rates of state initiated violence. We have oligopolies where you basically have a high number of distinct groups fighting each other and the regime. You've bifurcated violence. These are very, very rare cases in which control of the state is being, is being contested by an equally powerful to the government group. Again, this is in many ways a conflict that we don't see very often within African states anymore, but we are unfortunately seeing some views of it in the Sahel and cartel violence, which as I mentioned, most countries are now falling into, which is there's multiple subnational elites vying for power through the use of intermittent targeted violence. And police are often much more involved in that type of violence than security forces. But as we see in the areas of northern Nigeria, it's becoming a much bigger problem to control these militias once they get a hold of territory, even that they're not necessarily governing, but they are proliferating in. And here's an example, I can go over this if it's necessary, of the types of state insurgent militia and rioting and protesting that we're seeing presently across states. What, of course, we're looking for is a high rate of state force violence rather than insurgent rebel or militia violence. And we see that in, in fewer cases than we might want. What, of course, I think we all want is a low rate of all violence, but that violence that does in, that does happen have a very high rate of state involvement. Okay, so let's put this all together in the last minute. Regimes have more control than we think, and they will often choose alignment, which is engagement with elites subnationally over control. And this actually creates competitive violence. I'm happy to chat about that a bit more. A state's topography of power can and does change. And with that, so does the violent geography. So we've seen that over the last 10 to 20 years, the violence geography has shifted significantly. Militias are proliferating and threats will continue to multiply. And I mentioned this before, but I wanted to go here. What can be done? 
So violence evolves and adapts, and we are entering a more violent and fragmented world. But I really want to emphasize that the solution for this violence is not more development. And in several ways, it is, it, it is entirely separate from the developments that should happen around development and democracy. There's two central issues that need far more attention, which is the link between corruption and conflict. Again, these elites with zero sum competition and corruption are able to hire these militias to create these uh, to create violence. And then, of course, these militias can graduate up into more significant threats to the states. And then the business of violence or the market for violence that we see emerge within African states, which is that it's far more lucrative to engage in intermittent violence than it is to not engage in violence. And that requires, I would say, a very, very significant look at the subnational level and the types of militias that are being created locally rather than, um, or in addition to worrying about the national level threats, which are, are happening at an increasingly rare rate. So that's it for me. My 20 minutes is up. And so I will stop. I appreciate your attention and I'm sorry for the earlier problem.